the show and tell period. Oh, okay. This is a. That was the ship I was on. In the, okay, the Tate. The Tate, the USS Tate. It was a AKA 70, which is okay. an attack cargo ship. And there's some of the places we were at. Boy, you, got, you guys got around. We did, yeah. For being in service only a year, you know, or a little over a year, mm -hmm. we did. And af after I got off the ship, they even, uh, the war had ended and whatnot, and uh, they ended up taking, uh, as I understand it, stuff out for the first uh, uh, atomic test out there in Bikini Atoll. Oh, really? They dragged <laughs> a lot of the instruments and stuff out there. And now, are you a plank holder? Uh, well, I guess I was. Yeah, I put the, we didn't even have such a ceremony at that time, but uh, yeah, I, I put it in commission, right, Okay. back down in Charleston. And there's a history, attack cargo ship. We carried troops and a lot of their equipment, oh, okay. as opposed to an APA, which is slightly larger, and carried almost all troops, okay. with no equipment. But we carried half troops, half equipment, oh, a couple right. hundred troops, and uh, oh, some of their, uh, well, most of their, uh, their mortars and their ammunition and their kind of tank or two. We even had a little spotter plane, which is in there. Oh, really? one of, yeah, I mean, they, uh, their equipment, and uh -huh. they took it ashore in the what, in the invasion. 77, we worked to the 77th Division, and okay. while that was our main, <laughs> we also carried other troops, but that was the in the invasion of Okinawa and oh, Iwashima when they, they were the, the huh. guys we lugged around and put ashore and whatnot, so. Now, you offloaded equipment by crane? Uh, yeah, well, we had our own our own cranes, uh, you know, right on the deck there, and they just loaded them into the landing craft. Uh -huh. So we carried uh, 16 LCVPs and 8 LCMs. So we had uh, a good size ship. Oh yeah, yeah, we we were good size. We yeah. And it was and then after, right after the war, just as the war ended, we put the first troops ashore in Korea to take over from the Japs. Oh that really? Was in 1945, yeah, in September. Oh. Four. And then we also put Marines ashore in China. Oh, interesting. And then <laughs> they had us lugging. Chinese nationalist troops up from Hong Kong while Kowloon, which is the mainland of China, right outside Hong Kong. We carried the Chinese 13th Army and the Chinese 8th Army made two trips. Not our, uh, we weren't the only ones. We right. had a convoy up into northern China mm -hmm. to fight uh, Mao Zedong up there. Of course, these Chinese nationalist troops were so poorly equipped, they got wiped out. Yeah. But uh, we did our share. They wanted to go up there, and we put them up there, <laughs> put them ashore up in northern China. Now, I notice um, this camouflage pattern. Yeah, that was our Atlantic colors when we first put it into uh, in the service in the Atlantic. But uh, it, we only had those colors for, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks okay. or something. We went to the Pacific, and then they just painted it all battleship gray. Okay. Yeah, they didn't keep the colors like camouflages. Really? Yeah, so they, yeah. Now, why? Any reason for that? I don't know. I guess they decided that uh, the stuff wasn't very effective and... Uh, why, why bother? It was easier to just paint everything gray. So at the end of the war, they wouldn't, I never did see a ship other than ours at, at the very end there. And, I mean, there just weren't any. They just painted them all, all gray. Makes did it away simpler, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So Commander R. E. Lyon. Yeah, Rupert S. D. Lyon. He was quite a guy, really. He'd been a uh, quartermaster, which is what I was, in, in World War I. Really? This fall. So we, we got along pretty well, but uh, he'd, he'd come up through, and he was a, from San Francisco, and he used to be a, a, a pilot out there, I guess, between wars and mm -hmm. what, and then he came back in the service. But quite an interesting man. Big fell, 6'4", and he weighed about 250 pounds, and tough as nails, but great guy. <laughs> Everybody swore by him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got a few little things. So this... In the invasion of Iwashima, which was an island right, right off of, right. of, of, of oh, Okinawa, this is the. Uh, there was another half went down here, uh -huh. but all the fighting was here. Here was a mountain. Ernie Pyle was killed right here. The famous war correspondent oh. Ernie Pyle, and I think he had been our, on our ship. I'm not positive of that, mm -hmm. but just before he was killed, and they, we had some people there. We were also busy and whatnot that uh, didn't pay too much. But uh, yeah, this was. Uh, in fact. They have a uh, museum down New Orleans now. The uh, right, uh, and they're opening a new wing down there on invasions in the Pacific and whatnot. I'm 
My daughter's going to college down at uh, Tulane oh, nice. University. I just took her down and enrolled her down there. And I'm thinking the next time I get down there, I might give this to to what's his name, the guy Ambrose, Steve Ambrose, yeah, runs that. Yeah. Well, also keep us in mind. Oh, know, okay. What? Well, yeah. Museum up in Saratoga. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing against Steve Ambrose. <laughs> uh. Uh, today we're interviewing Mr. Donald L. Patry. It is uh, October 3rd, 2001. Interview at Latham Headquarters. Michael Akey, interviewer. Wayne Clark, videographer. Uh, Mr. Patry, where were you born, sir? In Schenectady, New York. You know. So you're a uh, uh, lifelong Schenectady? Well, most of my life. I did spend mm, most of the 70s in Southern California, but then I, I transferred out there with my company, and then I... Oh, I came back here. I had family here and whatnot, so I transferred back in 78. You went to school in Schenectady? I yeah, I went to, uh, I graduated from Scotia High, actually. We oh, okay. lived there for a couple of years, and I went into service from Scotia. But uh, I went to Union College. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Navy sent me there when I first went in. I was oh. 17, and they sent me into uh, uh, one of the first ones in the V-12 program. Now, uh, we'll explain that program. Well, it was an officer training program for Mostly for young fellows who were going first going in, and mm -hmm. uh, we had about 490, I guess, people who went in the program and they were at Union. And uh, I'd say that 490, probably 400, no, maybe not 400, 300 were freshmen, mm -hmm. just kids 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And you had a few years of college, and supposedly, and then uh, you got a commission. But uh, unfortunately, you had no choice of subjects and. Union at that time was strictly mostly engineering or medical, and uh, you didn't have any choices, as I say, of subjects. And he put me in engineering stuff, which I am totally <laughs> ignorant of, and I, I didn't do two. After two semesters, they, that's when I was transferred to Samson. Okay. And uh, but as a lot of others were, probably half the pro half the people get tr were transferred out, and it was a good program, but. Uh, so when did, what year did you get into the program? In uh, 1943. I, uh, I graduated from high school on June 23rd, 43, and well, I'd already taken the test to get into the program and when I was in high school and May took the test and I was sworn in on May 25th, mm -hmm. but then I finished high school and then July 1st went to Union, put the uniform on and started and uh, spent eight months there mm -hmm. and then I transferred to Sampson in March 4th, I think it was, uh, 44. Mm -hmm. Went through boots there, which was a snap compared to the training we'd had at Union. And, uh, really? Oh, yeah, because we'd had the regular Annapolis training, mm -hmm. and the V-12 program was just like the Annapolis cadets marching and everything. And a pretty, pretty stiff physical program, and it was a good program. Well, why'd you pick the Navy? Oh, my dad had been in the Navy in World War I. Oh, okay. And uh, although the funny part of it was he was... World War II and well, right after World War I, he worked for the Army for many, many years, like 38 years, a transportation officer, even though he was a civilian of the old Schenectady uh, Army Depot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I had, I just thought I'd like to be Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had one brother who was in the Army during the war, and one who got in the Army, my kid brother, right after the war. But I, I was Navy, and, and it was always my dad and I against the two brothers. <laughs> Although dad was, as I say, hooked up with the Army as a civilian. Do you, uh, do you remember where you were when you heard uh, about Pearl Harbor? Oh, very well, yeah. We were at home, uh, 352 Mohawk Avenue in Schenectady, and uh, listen, my brother and I were listening to the Giants-Brooklyn Dodgers football game. Now, you say Brooklyn Dodgers. There was a Brooklyn Dodgers football team at that time in the NFL, mm -hmm. and a uh, good team, and they were battling for the rights for New York and whatnot, and all of a sudden they broke in and... Uh, said Chief Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and uh, the game sort of fell apart, and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they just the players finished up, and they were talking to each other, I guess, apparently, and mm -hmm. I don't think anybody remembers who won the game or nothing, but it was a you know, Sunday afternoon, like 1 o'clock, we heard the news. Do you have any recollection of what went through your mind when you heard that? Yeah, I, uh, I, I figured it would change uh, all our lives. I really did, because I'd, I'd been a, oh, probably from the time I was 12, 14 years old, very interested in history. And I still like history and follow it pretty closely. And uh, uh, I watched Hitler and uh, 
take over these countries over there and listen to them. There were no TV, of course, and uh, I figured that eventually this would, would do it. We'd be in there fighting it. So. And I'd had quite a few friends who had been, who had gone into the service, uh, you know, ahead of, well, back in the early 40s, and they were older friends and going in. So I figured, well, eventually I'll end up somewhere along the line of going in there, so, which did happen. So what was Samson like? Uh, Samson was, a, as I say, the boot camp, uh, we had a very short boot camp. I believe it was six weeks, and they'd give you a week off, come home. And then uh, I had pretty high scores in, their, in the testings, and uh, uh, they said, well, you can go to any school you want to go to. So I looked over the uh, thing, and I decided I wanted to be a quartermaster, which is navigation, visual signaling, and whatnot. You're up on the bridge, and I figured that's what I wanted to be. And uh, so they sent me to school after the week's vacation there and leave and went back and went for 16 weeks there, and uh, which was a great program. Was it good training? Oh, excellent, excellent, yeah. And, uh, and then they transferred uh, everyone out after the 16 weeks. And, uh, oh, I ended up, they sent several of us down to Newport, Rhode Island mm -hmm. and uh, on a troop train. And <laughs> uh, we went down there and to be assigned to a ship, but we, I stayed there, and several of us stayed there, well, and then you were, we were assigned, uh, eventually I got assigned to a ship they called the USS Tate, which was being finished up down in Charleston, North Carolina, but while I was at Newport, oh, uh, well, you had to keep busy doing things, so I uh, took a review course for quartermasters, which was just a short week or two, mm -hmm. and I said, any more? Oh, they, by this time I'd been reassigned, and, or to, assigned to the ship, but they were forming a crew, and the fellow was going to be the navigator, a man named uh, Ensign Lay. He said, well, why don't you take a navigator's course? When did they come and talk to you again? Uh, <coughs> so then, uh, so I went to the review school for navigators, and I was, I guess, the only enlisted man in there, review school for navigators. I had a bunch of officers in there and commanders and <laughs> captains who were navigators who had been at sea, most of them, and they were waiting for a reassignment to ship. So that was fun. And uh, uh, when that was over, they, uh, we, we had, as I say, we were forming our crew, so they, uh, we worked in the, uh, they had a, the, the, the Naval War College is right there in Newport. Mm -hmm. This was in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, uh, the War College is just on a little island right off the, you walk across the bridge and you're on the island. And all kinds of admirals and everything else there. And we went over there and we worked down in the basement. They had a million different charts. And hmm. we corrected charts and brought them up to date for different ship crews. Mm -hmm. and eventually we got two. We did our own and got ours all up to date. Hmm. It was fun, fun duty. And, uh, Good metal. group of guys you were? Oh, yeah, great group of guys and who were going to be my, my shipmates and uh, whatnot. And uh, we, we had a lot of fun. I had a, had a real funny incident uh, happen. We were, had this one old fellow, he was assigned to be quartermaster on board our ship, and he was old enough to be my dad, I'm sure. And we're walking across this causeway this one afternoon to go over there after lunch, and, uh, and a bunch of officers are coming toward us, and one guy, I can see, he's an admiral. <laughs> and we're, I was still a seaman, hadn't got my, give me my rate. And uh, I'm saluting the officer, and this fellow, he goes like this to the officer stinky. And I said, oh, my God, I'll be in the brig. I'm with this guy, you know. And the officer said, what? What you saying? He, I, he says, I said, hi, stinky. Well, what had happened? These two had served on a ship in World War I together when this admiral was a young ensign. <laughs> well, they threw their arms. They hadn't seen each other since World War I. And they put their arms around and each other hugged, and I sort of walked on. But, <laughs> but it was, uh, for a minute I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to end up in a break with this guy. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of good, good things like that. And we, we, we did our training, and, he, and then uh, in about the middle of November, the ship was ready down in South Carolina. So they packed us all aboard a troop train, and down we went. And took us about I don't know, a day and a half to get down there, I guess. And, Night and day travel, we got down there. And, uh, but it's time. It was fairly cool. It was cooler than I thought it would be down in South Carolina. In fact, uh, we even had a little snow down there, really? which was unusual. 
and we spent Thanksgiving, and then a couple of days after Thanksgiving, they had the formal commissioning ceremonies. And the ship was the? The Tate, the USS Tate, you know, the KA-70. And uh, a couple of days later, we uh, we left there and come up the coast in Chesapeake Bay and had a shakedown cruise for mm, roughly a week, I guess. How'd that go? It went pretty good. The ship uh, operated fairly well. Uh, we uh, had a few minor problems, but uh, nothing serious. And then we pulled in the Portsmouth Naval Yard, and it was uh, like two days before Christmas at 44. So uh, they gave us all like 72-hour pass or something. And I made it home and <laughs> threw a series of buses and trains and got home for Christmas. Yeah, got home for Christmas. Got home Christmas Eve, and family uh, was not expecting me, and uh, uh, it was fun. And then Christmas night, uh, I, I, yeah, we, we left Christmas night. And that was the last I was home for over a year. And then, and we come back, we were up in the David, went up in the Davidsville, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and we picked up some uh, CB stuff, uh, equipment and whatnot. And we left there. I think it was on the like the 30th of December. Who was the skipper? Uh, at that time, we had a fellow named Jordan, Commander Jordan. And he had had some, apparently, some bad experience at sea, and he cracked up. And I, I, a lot of us listen men think he did it on purpose. Anyhow, they removed him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they took him out in a straitjacket, and then they replaced him with this Rupert S.D. Lyon, who was a great guy. And uh, But the first skipper, was he did he, he never did go out to, out to sea with us. And mm -hmm. So we, we left uh, Davidsville, Rhode Island, went down through the canal, which was an experience, too. Tell us about that. Well, we had left, uh, as they say, like the 30th of December, and it was bitter cold up in New England there. And went down, and two days later, we're down going through the canal. And we stopped in the eastern end or the Atlantic end, mm -hmm. Chris Tobel, and uh, just overnight. And then we left in the morning, and it was just the, it was like 110 degrees going through the canal and hot. And, uh, it took us a whole day. We left like 8 or 9 in the morning. We didn't get through the canal until oh, probably 6, 7 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, the heat was more than anything else. And, but it was interesting going through there. Now, what were your duties aboard ship? Uh, I was quartermaster, which involved uh, navigation. And I was trained in visual signaling. Signaling, uh, which is flags, semaphores, and whatnot. But we had a, a pretty good full staff of signalmen, so I rarely got into any of that, into the signaling. Uh, but uh, we were the expert helmsman, uh, quartermaster, which is, implies that. And we did train other, we, a lot of people, to, you know, to stand watches on the on the helm and go in any any tight situation in battle or whatnot. There was always a quartermaster on the wheel. And uh, hey, you, but you stood regular watches. You didn't stand in only battle or tight situation like going through the canal. Mm -hmm. Would you stand wheel watches? You didn't. Most of it was uh, taken care of. You observed all the weather conditions and noted all that. And you kept the quartermaster's notebook. Anything that went on up on the bridge or unimportant around the ship, you kept a, a written account of it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the officer of the deck. Uh, in a day or so, he usually would borrow your notebook because he had to write up a, a log, the ship's log. But if there had been a court martial, say, uh, the quartermaster's notebook was to be considered above the ship's log because really? it was much more detailed and written as you did things, you know. Okay. And where the other was a condensed version of what went on, mm -hmm. but they would take the quartermaster's notebook as to, you know, what really transpired. You kept a very detailed note. And then you kept, uh, as I say, you kept a weather log of all the, each hour you recorded the temperature and the wet and dry bulb and the barometer and the winds and the clouds and speeds and all kinds of stuff like that. You had to make monthly or hourly notations on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you assisted the, the officer of the deck. You were his right-hand man. And uh, you did Quite often you would take, especially if you're in a convoy, you would take, uh, we had radar, but we also did, uh, had statometers, which we could take uh, up to, say, 1,000 yards and get pretty good in, uh, accurate measurements as to 
how close you were to your other ships and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Had an interesting uh, experience once with that. We were in the Pacific and this officer, uh, Lieutenant Hersky, nice fellow. Uh, he was from New Orleans. In fact, his father had been the mayor of New Orleans at one time. He was a real congenial man, but he wasn't, he hadn't had much sea duty. And uh, the, uh, the captain uh, asked him to take a reading on the ship ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, how do you do that? He said, well, with the statimeter. So he said, quartermaster, give him a statimeter. So handed him, and he had no idea how to use it. <laughs> well, the captain made a couple of choice remarks, which I will not repeat. <laughs> and he said, show this, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> how to use this, blah, 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 blah thing, if you would, please. <laughs> and I felt embarrassed for the guy, because uh, he just hadn't had no experience in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I always always felt sorry for him after that. But he was a good officer. But we, we had a good crew. We went down through the canal, then we sailed out, uh, through the canal and out to, out to Pearl Harbor. We were in Pearl Harbor for well, about 10 days, and uh, that was interesting, and got ashore a couple of times. What was Pearl like at that point? Uh, very, very busy, and the ships going and coming in and out, and uh, it was, uh, the harbor, well, there wasn't any of the, the Arizona was still below, there wasn't any from the bug water. I mean, you can see bubbles and oil coming up and whatnot, but uh, they had pretty well cleaned up. All the rest of the mess was cleaned up pretty well. But we were, we'd, we'd go in Liberty into Honolulu, which was fun. And uh, one day it took a, they had a bus tour, went around the whole island, stopped the other side and went swimming and this and that and made their way back. And that's an interesting island, enjoyed it. But I see pictures of it now and it, of the uh, of Honolulu and whatnot. It doesn't look like, at that time, I guess the highest point on the, building was like three stories or something like that. Now they have skyscrapers and, you know, totally different landscape, but it was fun. And from there we left, after 10 days, we went up to uh, the island of Kauai, which is 95 miles northwest of Oahu. And we uh, picked up uh, some uh, CBs and some more of their equipment and whatnot. And interesting story there is we were only there like two days. And it was a totally different atmosphere from Oahu. I mean, no servicemen there, just a couple of these CBs and just a, a very small pier. We, we were on one side, I think there was another ship, small ship on the other side of the pier or something. And the closest town was about a mile. He walked in and we went in short and a uh, bunch of us and he walked up this dirt road, coral road sort of, and there were trees on all sides like jungle. You get in this little town, Hannah Pepe. And uh, it was about a block long, <laughs> and we walked through. We get through, and there's a bar right at the far end of town on the left, and the road ends, and it's just plain jungle right ahead of you. So well, I had a drink, and we come back, and halfway back through the city, there was a theater, and we went to the movies there, and it was fun. And then we went back to the ship, and on the way back, somebody got the brilliant idea. All these trees on the side of the road were banana trees, most of them. So some of the falls picked a couple stalks of bananas. We took them back to the ship and the next day the cooks had made banana cream pies for us. It was great. It was a nice treat. <laughs> Freshly picked bananas. And from there we went on. Well, let's see. I think my, the next one we went out. We made a lot of stops going out there. Uh, uh, well, describe the ship. What the, it's a AKA. A AKA. It's a, uh, it was I think the 400 and uh, 63 feet long. I could be wrong on that. It was about, pardon me, about oh, 15, 16,000 tons. And top speed was like 16 knots. So it's, yeah. yeah. Well, um, you're describing uh, the ship. Uh, yes. It, uh, it's an attack cargo. Attack cargo, what, what they call it. What does it mean by an attack cargo? Well, we went into, we were an invasion ship. Okay. Invasion, so we had a rather shallow draft. Uh, so we could get in, you know, as close to the shore as possible. And we carried landing craft. We carried a total of 24 landing craft. 16 of the LCVPs, which probably carried uh, 15 fully loaded or equipped uh, soldiers or Marines. And then the, the bigger one, the LCMs, we had eight of those, and they carried like double the amount. What kind of armor? Uh, on our ship, we had a uh, five-inch 38 gun on a Fantail, and then we had, uh, oh, I don't know, 
probably a dozen twin 40 Bofor right. anti-aircraft guns, and we had maybe 20, 20 millimeter guns, and we had a few, a uh, couple of 50 caliber machine guns. Okay. And, of course, <laughs> that, that was about it. We had a, an armory with a lot of uh, sidearms and stuff like that, but uh, as far as the actually equipped for battle and whatnot, that's what we carried. So the main armament was basically uh, the, the five inch 38 and the, and the twin 40, the anti-aircraft, which is what we had our most, uh, well, trouble with was the kamikazes, mm -hmm. but uh, which we did see a lot of. And uh, we went in from on out, made our way out to the Philippines mm -hmm. and a couple of stops in a way. Uh, we were there in the Leyte, Leyte Gulf, between Leyte and Samar. But, uh, we picked up the, eventually after a week or so there, we picked up the part of the 77th Division. And uh, there were several other ships come in and we, they picked up the rest of them. And we had a, uh, we, then we sailed down to the end of the uh, Leyte was Mindanao, which was still Japanese held. And we had a practice invasion there, mm -hmm. uh, getting ready for Okinawa. And we just put troops ashore and we withdrew them. Then we went back up. Well, eventually we left, uh, oh, I think it was around the 20th of March of 45, and we sailed north toward Okinawa. And uh, we, no one knew how big a battle that was going to be, as it turned out. But we had interesting, uh, on the way up there, the Japs apparently had spotted us, uh, or knew we were coming. And they, uh, but they did not attack us. Uh, they, uh, we knew they were dropping uh, mines ahead of us, especially at night. And so it was, we did come across, across a few of them during the day, and they, we exploded them. What the, now, you traveled in convoy? Yeah. What we, would be a typical convoy? Oh, they would have uh, between uh, our, our type of ship, the AKAs and the APAs, which were, as they say, a little bit larger than ours, but carried all troops, no, no equipment. But all, all troops, they'd probably carry, oh, anywhere 700 troops or so each, or maybe 1,000. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, where we'd carry like 250, and, but with their equipment. And we'd have uh, the convoy would probably be about oh, eight or ten ships, plus the escorts. We'd have destroyers, destroyer escorts, and maybe a baby flat top uh, escorting us. Uh, was Pretty, pretty good. We, we cruised along around 16 knots, 15, 16 knots usually, depending on the weather and the conditions and whatnot. But uh, one interesting uh, incident you might get a kick out of was uh, on the strip we were up, and it was sometime probably after midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. I was on duty up on the bridge, and the uh, radar people give us a buzz and said uh, we picked up something on radar blah, blah, and uh, the rest of the ship said too there was a Japanese plane way ahead of us about 18 miles ahead of us and uh, it was headed in our direction but it was not a flight of them, just one plane and it was moving so the uh, commodore or the convoy there the, said that nobody shoot until you get the, the word so they try, we tracked this plane in, and it kept coming right toward the convoy. And uh, uh, eventually, it got, we, they'd track it down like 18 miles, 16 miles, you know, right on down. They got two miles. We, I'm, I went out on the starboard wing of the bridge, and uh, you could see this plane came right down between our line of ships and the sh ships on our starboard side, which were maybe 500 yards to the right of us and to the starboard side of us. And this plane was no more than 200 feet in the air. And you, you, it was a dark night, but you could see the red uh, sparks flying out of his engine. Mm -hmm. you know, not a jet engine, they were all, of course, reciprocal ends and whatnot. And uh, it, he never saw us. And, he, and we didn't open fire. We never got the chance, but he went right down between the ships. Right on, continued on south, we continued on north, and no, nobody fired a shot. <laughs> he was just no more than 200 feet up in the air above us, you know. <laughs> But he just kept going. And, but uh, eventually, on uh, March 26, we got into uh, a place called Kuramoreto, which is a group of small islands 
all about 10, 12 miles southwest of the main island of Okinawa. And that was the beginning of the Okinawa invasion. We put the first troops ashore. And in fact, the first soldier that went in there is written up in a big history book. I fell on him, Meyer, Meyer, Sergeant Myers, was the first one to step ashore. And he, was, he slept next to me aboard our ship. On our ship, we had the troops and the, and the crew slept all together. Uh -huh. And we'd mingle and whatnot. How seaworthy was it? Uh, the ship was very seaworthy, although, so uh, uh, it was very seaworthy. We did hit typhoons later on, oh, really? and uh, we lost uh, a couple boats in one of them, and it's all written up in here, and uh, it was, uh, uh, they, they were something, those typhoons are almost as bad as the enemy. I mean, you get in there, and you're rolling up to maybe 45 degrees, and, and uh, it, <laughs> uh, it was, they were scary, and we had hit two of them, and both of the ones we hit, uh, we were empty. And as I, we were a top-heavy ship because we carried all these landing craft. Right. So what we did was we flooded our holes, just let seawater in where normally it would be cargo. Mm -hmm. we, we just flooded them, which sank us and kept us from rolling over. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have went down. And one of the typhoons, well, I don't think it was the one, there were a lot of typhoons out there, but it was one be just before us. Uh, they lost three destroyers, went down. In fact, Admiral Halsey caught hell for that. <laughs> he was, they say he was to blame for taking a ship into that typhoon. He could have avoided it. Hmm. And a lot of history books <laughs> say he was <laughs> he made a very fatal error, but they lost. And the, the cruiser Pittsburgh, which is a very modern cruiser, uh, she was one of the latest in big ship and next to a battleship, the most powerful ship. And we saw her just before she went into one of these typhoons, and she was a gorgeous ship, in fact, tied up next to us. And uh, we bumped into her shortly after she'd been in the typhoon, and the front 60 feet of her bow had been torn completely off, just like somebody ripped it off. It didn't go down because they had watertight integrity and closed all the hatches and the whatnot. But that is just like somebody had just torn 60, the first 60 foot of the ship right off, like paper. <laughs> they were powerful storms, very powerful. Now, uh, when you were at the Okinawa, Okinawa yeah. what was it like um, uh, well, that invasion? Well, it, uh, as I say, we, we, were in the, we took these islands on March 26th, and we finished up like the 30th of March or 31st, and then the L day or D day at, at the main island was April 1st, mm -hmm. when we just it was like from here to downtown Albany, away from where we were. So we were over there, and uh, they didn't need our troops right then. We just stood off off the beach there. Uh, it it was. The, the scary part of it was that the Japs had no ships. To th well, they did throw some, try to come down from Japan, but they, they were sunk hundreds of miles away from us. But uh, the kamikazes were the hardest thing. And there were a lot of those? Yeah, we, we, had, we were under attack probably at least a dozen times. And on the, April, on the night of April 2nd, which was the following day, I was, had finished it was about 6 o'clock. I had finished my dinner and had taken my dessert up on the main deck and was sitting there and looking out. And all of a sudden, out of a cloud bank, a kamikaze came out plowed right into the ship next to us, and it was in a troop transport next to us. Mm -hmm. And this, when I saw the towers get hit in New York a couple of weeks ago, it, instantly that flashed to me because it was a huge ball of flame. And, well, it's an earth thing, but they, they lost a lot of men, a lot of soldiers and sailors, of course. They wiped them out. I don't know how many hundreds of them. You never did get the figures on all of them, but uh, it, they were scary. And I might just read you one little sure. thing here. It said, after 28 days in the Okinawa area, the USS Tate withdrew to quieter waters. During these four weeks, she had been subjected to attacks by enemy aircraft, submarines, and suicide boats. Enemy suicide planes struck vessels ahead and a beam of her position in formation, and an escort vessel was exploded and sunk. Now, that, that's a little bit. We were under attack right. quite a little. And, uh, but... Uh, then, uh, we, as I say, we didn't put our troops right on the main island, but 
we circled south of the island, and then on the 16th, we went into this little island right off the coast, Iishima, mm -hmm. which is where Ernie Pyle was killed, and we were there for uh, four or five days, and they captured the island, which was small, really a small island, but paid a heavy price for it. Did you get ashore at No, no, I, I didn't. We didn't, uh, the sailors, we didn't go ashore. I mean, our, our landing craft went to the beaches, but uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't really get it, you know, onto the... We had an in interesting... Uh, one of these nights we, we had pulled all, away from the little island over to Okinawa because the kamikazes were hitting the convoys and the ships at the pretty good, so we said, oh, we'll get a couple miles away. We went over to Okinawa and we were right, oh, maybe 200 yards offshore, less maybe, and it's probably 8 or 9 o'clock and it's dark, it's in April, and uh, we see these lights coming down the water toward us, a boat. So we, the captain said, get on the bullhorns, and we notified this craft that was approaching us, don't come any closer or we'll blow you out of the water. Identify yourself. So what it was, it was a couple of Marines in one of these ducks, what they call a duck, mm -hmm. and they were lost. And they were afraid to go ashore that, that they would be, would be behind Japanese lines, and they could have been. So uh, I was at the quartermaster, had to go in, and I said, where are you trying to get to? You know, asked them, and, and I told them what uh, direction, how far to go, and come this way, and take a course of so-and-so degrees. And Oh, they were, they were, they were crying. <laughs> just about, they didn't want to go. They were so happy to know where to go, because they had no idea. They were just totally lost. But they... They were, they were happy that we didn't blow them out of the water and that we gave them directions to, to hit, be, get behind their own lines. So how they get lost, I don't know. <laughs> they didn't say. <laughs> what did you do for recreation on board? Uh, not an awful lot. You read, and uh, you usually stood... Uh, well, we did. Well, in quieter waters, when we, were, we did have movies. And, uh, in fact, after the uh, Okinawa operation, we... They pulled us down into uh, Saipan, and uh, I remember we were almost there. We had movies for the first time, I don't know, a couple months, and they had ice cream, and oh, everybody was you know, like little kids. We, the tension, you could feel the stress go off your body, you know, and it was great. But uh, and, and then we went down, and, but as I said, recreation, not great. <laughs> Some fellows like to play cards and shoot crap. I, I was never into it myself, but uh, you read, and... You, you, you worked uh, a lot. You had uh, four hours on and eight hours off, four hours on, eight hours off. But in your eight hours, like if I had the, uh, say, the mid-watch, you know, which would be from midnight to four and then from uh, noon to four in the afternoon. But between eight in the morning and four in the afternoon, I had other duties uh, on the bridge. And, uh, yeah. We're going to change tape. It was a good experience. I mean, you felt, well, happy we're back out on the water again, you know, even though you've been out there for months before, you know. Now, uh, did you cross the equator? Oh, yes, we did. We well, did. After, after this trip to Saipan, they sent us down to, uh, down to Guadalcanal to pick up some Marines. There were still Marines left from the battle down there. Mm -hmm. So we went down, I think it was, I'm not sure, I think it was the 1st Marine Division, or I uh, could be wrong. And that was, we got down there, and uh, we did get ashore there. Well, we'd gotten ashore at Saipan, too. These islands were pretty secure. But, oh, one, one in, uh, little incident on Saipan. Uh, I wanted to get ashore, get ashore. I volunteered for a working party to go get some food at <laughs> stores. We needed some. And uh, while I was there, they, there was a prison camp there where they had some Japs, and they, they turned, well, right when I was there, when they turned some, a few Japanese prisoners loose and told them to go up in the hills, tell your buddies, come on down, you're being treated well. And, you know, they, they wanted them to go get, they didn't turn a lot of them, but they turned a few and choose some prisoners. And by, that, uh, by the way, at Okinawa, we had, a, we had two, the, probably the very first two prisoners taken in that campaign hmm. aboard our ship, and uh, they were interesting. And it was the night I was telling you about the ship was next to us got hit. Right. We had them in our brig. We had a brig, <laughs> two cells. And one of these fellows was a Army lieutenant, big, tall Japanese man, and the other was a little short private, very quiet. And uh, the lieutenant wanted to commit Harry Carey, 
he asked uh, for just, he said, just a pistol. He could speak good English. And he said, I, I just want to die. I'll kill myself, you know. And no, no, no. So we, we had this army lieutenant aboard our ship uh, was with the troops, and he could speak some Japanese and whatnot. So he ended up uh, talking with him, and we, we gave him food. And uh, the young private, uh, well, he, he was so happy. We gave him some cigarettes, and man, he, he was in heaven. He wanted to enlist in the, in the, in the Navy. <laughs> and the lieutenant gave some pretty valuable information to our Army lieutenant, and uh, that, was a, that was a bad night. We were under attack a lot. And I, my battle station at the time was down underneath the brig, down way down in the after steering engine room, and uh, in case the bridge got knocked out, I could steer the ship from down in the steering engine. And uh, I could see these, and it was just a, like six steps up this ladder to, to where the brig was, and I'd stick up my nose and watch and see these two guys, what was going on, you know. They, they relaxed, and they didn't want to leave the ship the next day or so. Two days later, they transferred them to a different ship, and they wanted to stay with, be with us. <laughs> but... Uh, well, anyhow, we went down to Guadalcanal, and we picked up these Marines, and uh, what they had them, they used to have interesting things. So we went to a movie there one night, right on, the, and you had to walk through a patch of jungle, I guess you'd call it, and, uh, and they, of course, everybody had to have their sleeves down because malaria and whatnot, even though you took Adamarine and stuff, you still had it. But uh, they said it was not uncommon, uh, and they, they did it when we were there. They, in the middle of a movie, they'd all of a sudden turn on all the lights. It was out in the open, you know, in the, in the open air theater. And quite often they'd catch a Japanese sitting there watching a movie. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was rather common. It, it, they didn't catch one when I was there, but they, they did. They'd flip the lights on right in the middle of the movies and there, the Japanese watching a movie. <laughs> so, uh, it, and one interesting thing, part of it, and we picked these Marines up and we took them back to Guam. Well, on the way back to Guam, this uh, one night, uh, around a little after midnight, uh, I was up again on watch up on a bridge, and out on the wing of the bridge, and uh, this Marine, one of the young Marines came up, and he was very upset, and he said, I want to speak to the officer in the deck. No, oh, wait a minute, and I went into the, into the wheelhouse, I guess he was in, we were on the bridge, right in the bridge, and I said, there's a Marine out here who wants to speak to you. So he come out, and so, I didn't pay attention to what's going on. Then the officer called me. I was just, would you get down and get the uh, the Marine commandant or the Marine uh, head man there? <laughs> I don't know what he was, a major or something down. Wake him up and tell him there's a little problem up here. So, hey, okay, I went down and woke up this guy. And Okay, I'll be right up. So I'm on the way back to the bridge by him, coming up. And all of a sudden, this young Marine came flying down the deck the ladder. And just tumbling down. He was out of his mind. And I stepped back, otherwise he would have knocked me. And he got down to the next level, and he crawled on his hands and feet, right me from here to, to you. And then uh, he tumbled down the next deck, and by this time I'm chasing him, and the officer of the deck was chasing him. And he tried to, uh, where our, our gangplank was pulled up alongside, and the, the, uh, the side of it, he could have jumped right over. He wanted to commit suicide. Instead, he, he's on all fours, and he tried to squeeze under the, the ladder there, and we gra each grabbed the leg and we held him. And uh, he's screaming and wanted, let me go, let me go. He wanted to commit suicide, I wanted to go over. And uh, he would have succeeded if he'd gotten across. But by this time, the, the Marine officer showed up and, and uh, a couple other people showed up. We got our ship's doctor up and they gave him a shot, put him in a straitjacket. Mm -hmm. But the poor kid, you know, you felt sorry for him. He's a good, good man. He just flipped out and he didn't want to go back into battle and he knew that's where he was going to go back up. So, uh, we get into uh, Guam and I don't know what they did with him. And, uh, they probably put him in a hospital and sent him back. But we, we got back to the States after that ourselves for a while. You know, got a new complement of landing craft and whatnot. We went back out. And on, uh, oh, hit a couple of places. We went in any way talk, which was a a part of the Marshall Islands out there. I had a, my closest buddy in high school was <clears throat> uh, on a little, one of the little uh, islands in there, Ferry Island, a little, about a block. <laughs> he was, I don't know, a radio man, I guess, on there. And uh, I got to see him. And it, was a, it was a party island. We used to send the troops to get two cans of beer and a Coke, you know, type of deal. And he, had, he was 
living in the tent. He says, you don't have to have that. Come on down to my tent. We went down there. He had some good stuff on and whatnot. <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was fun. And uh, I, uh, they had a, on the, the main island of any we talked there, they had a, a, a chapel. And uh, I went to church there. And mm -hmm. right on next to the chapel was a, a bomber bay, uh, strip. B-24 bombers had taken off, and that, you look out, you can almost reach out and touch the wing during the service, you know. Went to mass there, and the, the priest would have to stop for a minute. Wait a minute, another plane's taking off. <laughs> and this plane was, as I say, you could almost reach out the window and touch the planes right. taking off. But that, just a little interesting. And we left there, and going up toward Guam, and we had, is when we first heard about the first atomic bomb being set off. And we got into Guam, about three days later, I guess it was. And uh, we no sooner were there, and, and uh, it was August 15th, I guess it was, and uh, we, uh, uh, they, they, word came that the, the Japanese had agreed to surrender. <laughs> a bunch of guys were chipping paint on it. We'd been there an hour or so. Everybody was throwing brooms and stuff in the bay and paint trippers. And it was quite a party. And But the, that night, the, the, the skipper, we had some beer aboard. Uh, uh, we had uh, picked up in the States and whatnot. And uh, we, uh, so the skipper said, everybody you can drink as much as you want down, you know, but don't come above decks because Admiral Nimitz is headquarters right on top of that cliff over there. And, and we don't, I don't want them to see drunken sailors on the deck. So every, drink what you want. So it was quite an interesting uh, night. <laughs> It was a good party. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really participate. I was. I wanted to remember, yeah. and I wasn't much of a drinker anyhow. So, but uh, uh, it was an interesting day. The next day, we, they had the shore party and go shore and have a couple of beers. And that I went ashore and had a couple of beer on, on the beach. That's all. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we, later on, we, uh, our ship. Uh, oh, we went up to Okinawa and whatnot, and when we put. Uh, and the, as I say, the war ended, and uh, uh, we transported troops into army troops into Korea to take over from the Japanese. We went on up in the Jinsen Co, Incheon, I guess they call it now. That's where MacArthur later on during the Korean War had its big invasion here. Well, we were there five years earlier, <laughs> and they had the second highest tide of uh, in the world, next oh. to the next to the yeah next to the Bay of Fundy, which is uh, Newfoundland or somewhere down there the second highest tide. So you had to be careful with your ship going in there. You didn't want to get too close to, to the beach because you'd be, end up on the beach, you know, and because, uh, I don't know, 20-some feet tide or something distance, you know, tremendous. But uh, after then we went into, as I was telling you earlier, we went into, we put Marines ashore in uh, Taku Bar, and they went into Tinsin, China, and uh, it was contingent, and we, we left some of our small boats there, and different ships would uh, drop supplies there, and our boats would mm -hmm. run up the river. I mean, it was quite a trip up there to take the supplies up the river to the Marines. And uh, we then we went down. We were in, oh, we were down the Philippines for a while, Manila. We saw Corregidor and uh, all those famous places. Manila was a shambles. That city was pretty well beat up. And uh, uh, lost them. Good friend of mine was <coughs> got reported ill. We were uh, ashore this one afternoon, had a few drinks, and going back to the ship. And that's three or four of us. And uh, he decided, no, nah, I'm not going back right now. A couple other guys. And I said, hey, you're going to be late. And eh, it's all right. We're going to go back and have another drink or something. So <coughs> anyhow, next day he turned in sick. And we had a doctor aboard our ship, Dr. Heinen from Chicago. And anyhow, we didn't know what it was. He tried to diagnose it, and then he f finally diagnosed it as it was a form of rare form of spinal meningitis. Hmm. Went up to his brain, and anyhow, we pulled out from there, and we were going to, <clears throat> and it was supposed to have been a uh, hospital ship was supposed to meet us, and we were going to transfer this fall. And the hospital ship never kept the rendezvous with us. And uh, anyhow, the, the skipper kept him alive, or the skipper, the doctor kept him alive, and for a couple of days, few days, and uh, but the fever went up and destroyed his brain, and uh, he's 20 years old, and uh, uh, he died. And I, I talked to the doctor just a few minutes after he pronounced him dead, and 
he was up on the bridge and he came up and had put in the notebook and all this stuff. And I said, gee, uh, I, you know, what was it when I told him? And he said, it's highly contagious. And I said, geez, I was with him, you know, with that afternoon is last, mm -hmm. and I, do I have to be worried? And he says, no. He said, that was, you know, several days ago. And he said, he said, you don't have to worry because I, he said, I've kept them isolated, you know, for the last few days. And he said, but I'm worried. He said, I'm scared too. He, told, he said, I am. He said, I'm just hoping and praying I survive another 48 hours and don't come down with it. He didn't, so he was all right. I said, well, how did he get it? And he said, it was probably either airborne or on the rim of the glass or something. He said, I don't know, you can't tell, but he said it was, but he said, I'm scared. But he, he, luckily, and we, we had a nice burial, burial, burial at sea for him. And sent the flag home to his mother and whatnot, a little note. But uh, yeah, one of, that was one of the few actually the only man uh, from our ship who died, and that was not through a battle <laughs> inflicted. But we then we carried these Chinese troops, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's troops from uh, Kowloon, which is the mainland right off Hong Kong. There, we carried the 19th, uh, pardon me, the 13th Army and the 8th Army up into northern China, two different trips, and <clears throat> on one of the trips, one of the Chinese soldiers died, and uh, they they were so poorly equipped and such poor health. And this, we, we put them in our holds as, as cargo. And they were not allowed, of course, in any other part of the ship. And uh, one, of, one of our officers was down going through the hole down there. And this guy had been dead maybe 24 hours or so, sleeping with his, his own troops. Nobody cared. They didn't care whether he was dead or alive. No, and life was so cheap. So we gave him a nice burial. Oh, first of all, they re we reported to the deaf to and there was a, uh, a general, the Chinese general, was on one of the other ships who was in charge of this whole army. And, he's, and we said, well, we're going to want to bury him. Oh, no, no, no. No Chinese soldier has ever been buried at sea. He must be buried at, on land. Hold on to him. We'll bury him when we get. <laughs> Our skipper said, hell with you, buddy. We pulled out. We buried him at sea. He said, I'm not holding this guy. That's he had cholera. He died of cholera. Our doctor, the same doctor, diagnosed him with cholera. And uh, so we buried him. We gave him a nice funeral. His own buddies never showed up the funeral. I mean, all the, our sailors were there at attention, you know, and played um, Chinese flag and the whole thing. Yeah, his own buddies could care less. There was just no, you know, they, they, life was so cheap, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, when we, we got up to the, this one, I don't know if it was the same trip or the other trip, we up to Chinwang Tao, which is the most northern port city in China, and you can see the Great Wall from there. Mm -hmm. Way in a distance in the mountain comes down, you can see the wall there. And <clears throat> they were unloading their stuff. And one of these soldiers was so sick he could hardly get off the ship. He couldn't march in to fight, certainly. And he just sat there on the dock and very stoically sat there with his head down. And we gave him a little food there. And, he, and we had to leave. And his own troops could carry less and I'm sure the guy just died there. You know, on the dock, nobody took care of him. There was a city there, like, and nobody, nobody was interested in taking care of him. I mean, life was so cheap. Yeah. And uh, I was thought one of the, they had a, a, one of the local Chinese stevedores there could speak English, and I was talking to him this one evening, and uh, I said, gee, how's this communist problem up here with Mao Zedong, you know? And, uh, I said, do you have any problems with these people, you know? He says, yeah, he said, he says, I'm one of them. <laughs> he said, but you guys are paying me to unload the ship. He said, eh, after you're gone, I'll go and fight with him. I, you know, I mean, that was <laughs> a very complicated situation. But here we, then he was hired and paid by the American government to help unload the stuff and whatnot. And, <laughs> and here he was a, 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 one of Mao Zedong's men. <laughs> so you, uh, you said you were shell back. Yes, yeah, when on our trip to uh, Guadalcanal, we went on, on May 7th, on a mission of war, as the certificate says, we were, we were going to, uh, went across the equator, had a great time. In fact, I have a lot of pictures in here doing that. What was that ceremony like? <laughs> oh, here's, I'll let you see. It was great. They, uh, of course, they, uh, they shaved your head, they, you went in a, <laughs> a bunch of uh, oil and <laughs> had a tank of oil and water and mm -hmm. get paddled and... <laughs> But uh, we had a we had a good time. It, it was a lot of fun. It, uh, Did you get your certificate? Oh yes, I have it. I, have a, I, I was looking forward to come today, and I 
I didn't think to bring it until the last minute, and I just couldn't locate it at the, at the moment. Yes, I do have the certificate, yeah. Yeah, he crossed over that, went down and then back up. And, uh, uh, and of course, we went across the international date line I don't know, half a dozen times. I guess that was a common place, going in and out of there. Keeping what, was, what was your final cruise? Uh, final cruise was uh, coming back from, we brought troops back from Okinawa, a lot of Army troops and mixture of Army, CB, Air Force, all kinds of, plus our own. And we came back up into uh, Seattle, Washington. And this was um, a couple that we ended up in Seattle a couple of days before Christmas uh, 1945. Mm -hmm. uh, spent, spent Christmas on board ship. Uh, half the, our crew were uh, going to be discharged. And I, I was young, didn't have enough I, a family, and I was like, you didn't get as many points to get. Right. I had to wait a couple months before I got discharged, but I didn't mind. I was glad to be back in the United States. And, uh, on Christmas Day, there were only all, and that, the half that weren't sent home for discharge were another half was sent out, were given a couple weeks leave, and so we had less than a quarter of the crew. Well, our skipper, as I said, it was from San Francisco. He had his wife and daughter, who was a very pretty girl by age, uh, come up from uh, San Francisco up to Seattle, and uh, they worked in a galley cooking turkey, and along with a couple of the ship's crew, uh, cooks and whatnot. And we had a nice Christmas dinner and a very nice time. You had a board ship. And, very, and then uh, that was Christmas. And then uh, somewhere around about the 10th of January, I, I got a couple of days, a couple of weeks leave, and I came home to Schenectady. Sco Sco uh, Schenectady. My folks had moved back to Schenectady from Scotia. And I came home for a month, and it was cold, and I, I, I was shivered for all the time I was here, I guess. And... Uh, but uh, then I went back and uh, uh, eventually I got off the ship in uh, San Francisco and uh, I was on Treasure Island for a few days and that was interesting there too. And I had a German prisoner of war camp on Treasure Island and now these guys were tough looking. They were Africa Corps, Rommel's men, and man they were hard nosed, hard nosed. You could see them, and you walk by the fence, and, but, and they'd stare at you with hatred in their eyes, you know, really. And they were, even though they were in prison, they never going to get out and go home. They were, you can see, so bitter, unbelievable. Mm. And they were like, almost like, uh, I don't know, mechanical men or something. And I went to church uh, mass, and they had one of these German soldiers as an altar boy. And, uh, we, you know, he's going to serve mass. And he was, everything was just like in a square like there's marching, you know, on, instead of being relaxed on, on the altar, you know, and he was just like he was an automation, you know, automat, just, and uh, I mean, they were, those guys were so, and they were, they're fierce looking and they hated it. <laughs> I mean, just looking at you. you? <laughs> uh, so I actually got to see German prisoners, Japanese prisoners, and when I was at Samson, uh, went into Rochester weekend, one weekend, and uh, they had a, an Italian prisoner war camp up near Rochester. And those guys, they used to turn loose. And they had regular leave, liberty. And uh, bumped into a couple of them at a bar there one Saturday night. They had to be back by midnight or something. And they had big PW on their back or something. But they were happy-go-lucky guys. And they'd have a drink, you know. <laughs> they had a little money. And they were, not, they were no threat to the United States whatsoever. <laughs> they were happy. And as I say, they, they were given liberty like we were. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I did get to see all three prisoners of Japan, Germany, and uh, Italy. When's the last time you saw the ship? The ship? Uh, that was in 1946. Yeah, in, uh, when I, after I get, as soon as I get off there, I, that was the last I saw. It, as I say, shortly after that, it was, uh, I, I, from corresponding a couple of phones, it uh, carried stuff out to the Bikini Atoll for the first atom bomb test out there. Mm -hmm. It carried a lot of the instruments and stuff out there. And if I'd stayed on, I <coughs> would have been on that trip. And then I went down to Panama, and it was in the Panama Canal for a while. I stayed there. I don't know what I was doing. I had a, I had a relative. So, um, I had a, uh, an aunt, and uh, my mother's sister and her family lived down there. My uncle was a, uh, one of the chief engineers on the locks during the war, one of the top men, and ran the Panama Canal. So and do you know whatever happened to the, to the ship? Yeah, I... Uh, 
I sent away uh, and to a, one of these things in one of the magazines, and uh, they tell you what happened. And uh, apparently, the ship was uh, the Luckenbach steamship lines had it for a while, and then uh, it was getting old. And I don't don't know what year, but uh, it was sold for scrap. It ended up being scrapped, I guess. Yeah, like so many other ships. I had a talking about being scrapped here this past March. Uh, I was down in Charleston, South Carolina, with a singing group, the Capital District Youth Chorale, mm -hmm. chaperoning, and uh, one of our things we did with the kids, and they had the uh, uh, the Yorktown the carrier down there, and it made a museum. It was great, and we I, we went aboard that, and. I didn't realize it, but there's a, a destroyer tied up with it and then a Coast Guard cutter. And I looked at the destroyer. It was one of the ones that was hit. The Kamikaze is one of our, our escorts. And she, I, I, the Laffey, USS Laffey, 724, and she's tied, tied up down there right next to the to, – and I didn't have time to get aboard. I, you know, I had, could only get what I wanted to go aboard, but tears came to my eyes when I saw it. And, uh, you know, I, I hadn't seen a, the, one of our ships in, since the war, and here was this past March. And so she's down in Charleston. What did you do when you got home? Uh, took it easy the first summer, and uh, then went back to Union in the in the fall. Yeah, and uh, kicked around for a while, and then I, I got into transportation. My dad was in transportation and for the government. Somehow or other, I. I know a lot of uh, uh, trucking people who used to call on him and whatnot for government orders and whatnot. And one of them asked me to go to work in uh, Interstate Motor Freight and ended up in sales for a trucking business and then with several others. And I ended up spending 30 years in a trucking business with different outfits, uh, PIE, uh, Associated Transport, and several others. And then uh, kicked around. Uh, I, Got married, and well, that's another story. I don't particularly care to go into too much, but uh, okay. I do have a daughter now who's the well. I have a son who's married, and lives in Connecticut. He's got several children. In fact, his, one of his daughters got married last Friday night. I was part of the wedding here in Schenectady, and I I have a daughter by my second marriage. And her mother died exactly two years ago today, yeah. and uh, but uh, she's in Tulane University. I took her down to Tulane. Here last month we drove down. <coughs> so she's down by myself, the cat and I. <laughs> but uh, now she calls me every other day, just about. So, oh, yeah, she's doing well down there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, sir, and really thank you, thank you, you both. Our pleasure.